Well, welcome everybody. My name is Oliver Dodd, one of three co-directors based at the Centre for the Study of Social and Global Justice. Today, the Centre is very pleased to be welcoming Carlos Cruz Mosquera. Carlos is a third year PhD candidate and teaching associate at Queen Mary University in London. His research, uh, his research centers on examining the role of the European Union in Latin America and the Caribbean using a decolonial Marxist lens. His current work more particularly focuses critically on critically assessing Europe's commerce with and aid to Colombia and how these have impacted the recent peace process in 2016. Carlos had his work published in academic journals, academic textbooks and popular news outlets like Tribune, Morning Star, Monthly Review, Jacobin and among others. He was born in Via Vicencio in Colombia but currently lives in London uh, in Britain. Carlos's online talk today is titled The European Union in Colombia, Peace Building or Imperialism. Carlos, you have approximately 45 minutes for your talk and we'll follow this with a similar amount of time for the Q&A. Over to you, mate. All right. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try and keep the, the presentation not too long, so maybe we can we can have a, a longer discussion. Um, but yeah, thank you, Oliver. Um, and and um, I also wanted to say that um, Oliver was actually early on in this research that I'm about to present to you to you all Oliver I spoke to Oliver and you know speaking to him helped me shape some of what I'm about to say so so yeah so thank you for that as well um okay and before I begin I would also like to say that uh, this academic work doesn't pretend to be neutral uh, as a matter of fact one of the strengths uh, of this approach, under, of the uh, approach undertaken here, echoing the arguments put forward by the late anti-colonial Marxist thinker Walter Rodney, is that the declaration of inevitable subjectivities uh, need not hinder the value and quality of the research, or at least no more than when they are veiled. Bourgeois scholars, as you all know, are given a long leash with which to include their own very ideological interpretations without having to declare their standpoints. So the declaration from my side is that I'm Colombian of a, a working class and racialized background whose family has been directly impacted by some of the issues that will be brought up today. And concretely, it means that in the final analysis, I stand with those who continue to, to be exploited and, and oppressed under a capitalist and imperialist world system and who are looking to overcome it. It's also important to mention, uh, as you can probably hear from my accent, that I was raised here in the UK from a very young age. And so, although I'm constantly challenging the dominant liberal Western or Eurocentric standpoint, my worldview is un undoubtedly affected by this. And so feel free to challenge, challenge this if and when it seeps out. And then one last thing I wanted to bring up before I present my research is the terrible genocide of the Palestinian people taking place as we speak. Uh, keeping in mind, it's uh, keeping them in mind is important um, uh, to present these ideas as if people mattered, and more particularly as if the most oppressed under this global system mattered, which are the colonized people of the of the global south. Okay, so. In terms of my research, it looks at the role of the European Union in Colombia, and more specifically, its role in the peace building efforts, demonstrating that its economic interests are in contradiction with these. I also argue that although the means are different, the end result of European involvement is not too dissimilar to US imperialist policy in the country. And that's the, the general point I will make today. I'd like to begin, however, by giving you a detailed description of the people at the center of this research. And then the second half of the presentation will discuss the EU's behavior in this community and offer a broader analysis of what I think are the causes of the conditions that these communities suffer today. 
It's usually the other way around, theory first and empirics after. But I thought that having a more precise idea of the people at the center of this story would help to enrich the broader and more abstract ideas and concepts that I'll discuss in the second part of the presentation. So my empirical research focuses on Colombia Southwest and more particularly the Valle del Cauca department and a municipality of around 56,000 people known as El Cerrito. The majority of those who live here are of African descent, officially 32% according to the last census, but of course it's gonna be uh, much more than that. It's just that they, they chose not to record it in the forms. So they, they are descendants of enslaved Africans brought over during the colonial period. And so generations of this community have lived in the area since the colonial period, but have also joined have also been joined by more recently by internally displaced families fleeing more violent conditions elsewhere in the country. The majority of these families live in a local town where they supposedly have better access to public resources compared to those living more rurally, but where 80% of them live on salaries below the minimum wage. The main employment in the area is in the sugar industry, either on the sugarcane plantations as corteros, which are sugar cane, sugar cane cutters, or processing sugar in the uh, sugarcane refineries. It's also worth pointing out that the owners of the sugar companies are often the descendants of the Spanish colonists, in this case, the Cabal family. And actually, uh, Cabal, uh, they, there's a, uh, an important politician in Colombia today, a congresswoman, who uh, belongs to the Cabal family and, and is actually a, a far right, actually one of the main voices of the far right uh, political establishment in Colombia. All right. A typical day for many of the families in El Cerrito involves them getting up in the early hours of the morning, women and girls having to get up first to clean working utensils, wash and prepare clothes, and prepare meals for the man of the house, who is often the one who's employed by the sugar companies. He wakes up at 4 a.m. to be ready to leave at 5, as he's expected to be work at 6 a.m., and often arrives back at home at 7 in the evening. The physical demands and health impact of this type of work on the corteros cannot be understated. A cortero performs around 5,400 movements of the arm per shift. The health effects of such bodily exertion, apart from the obvious hand and wrist injuries, has often tended to result in health conditions such as lower back pain, back pain due to posture, acute pain in the spine, hypertension, cerebrovascular illnesses, Diseases, diseases of the respiratory system and dehydration. Beyond the direct physical impact of the work, one must also consider that the laborers are always exposed to the elements. The weather, for instance, ranging from high temperatures in the mid 30 degrees to tropical rain showers. This is all before considering the health and environmental effects of some of the industry's practices, such as regular burning of sugarcane and the widespread use of glyphosate as a herbicide and crop desiccant. I argue that all of this, the extreme working hours, the unrecognized labor by women and girls in the household, the physical and mental degradation of these workers and their families, their poor remuneration, does not just amount to exploitation, but to super exploitation, as it has been put, uh, been put forward by Marxist dependency theorists. The harsh, the harsh conditions for the families of El Cerrito, reminiscent of the conditions suffered by their enslaved ancestors, have become more intense and generalized since the 1960s. U.S. agricultural, uh, US agricultural engineers came to Valle del Cauca uh, to advise the authorities and the sugar producers on advanced science and, techno and technology for the industry, looking to secure new producers of sugar after the Cuban revolution. The lands in El Cerrito that, have, that had once belonged to African descent communities where they practiced small scale and subsistence farming were swallowed up by the sugar plantations and its refineries. 
the effect of the expansion of the sugar industry over the decades is not just the rife labor exploitation of the local community, but also the taking up of the majority of the cultivable land, which in turn further impoverishes them by ending their subsistence farming practices that had been passed down from generation to generation. And the small areas of land that are still in the hands of the community are mostly uncult uncultivable today due to the sugar industry's destruction of the local ecosystem. Furthermore, we can observe that although the majority of the people in Colombia suffer from impoverishment and violence, be it structural or direct, the people of El Cerrito and other areas like it suffer from these to an even higher degree. I argue that this is because of the colonial legacies of racial and gender hierarchy that sees these black communities as disposable, not just in terms of labor, but in terms of their humanity in, ge in general. This setup is of course not isolated and we can see evidence of, of it throughout the country. Another case which I have investigated is located only a few miles north of El Cerrito in a town called La Paila. Located in the municipality of Sarsal, northern Valle del Cauca, La Paila is a small town of around 6,000 inhabitants of which 84% of its population identifies as being of black descent. The town was built to house the laborers that worked on the nearby sugar plantations, and then later in the refineries, confectionery factories, and other related agro-industrial projects belonging to the prominent Caicedo family. Today, the town's principal employers continue to be the Caicedos who own the land and who have the majority control of the inter internationally successful companies Rio Paila Castilla SA and, Colum and Colombina SA. The latter monopolizing not just Colombia's, but the Andean region's confectionery market. Despite the town's, pop the town's population playing a central role in the high levels of development of the local industries, and particularly for the above mentioned companies, they by and large continue to live in conditions of poverty, inequality, and without adequate access to basic public services. Like with El Cerrito, we can observe how the combination of capitalist development based on the exp expansion of the export sector and the social hierarchies, race and class, come together to produce and reproduce conditions of structural violence, and which I argue lies at the root of the armed conflict. Let's now turn to a discussions, uh, discussion of the ways in which the European Union and its member states are linked to all of this. Scholars studying the war and violence in Colombia have in recent decades caught up with the revolutionary analysts that have been, uh, with what revolutionary analysts have been saying all along, that the conflict cannot solely or principally be pinned to political rivalries that at the root of the violent conflict was not, really, was not really the rivalry between the liberal and conservative parties, but that a more profound examination unveils the centrality of Colombia's capitalist development. Unlike in the more conventional readings of the conflict, the inter-party violence that of course did exist becomes an epiphenomenon. As part of this logic, at the fringes of more mainstream readings, it is argued convincingly that Colombia's vast social and economic problems, as it is with other countries and regions around the world, cannot simply be put down to political rivalries or corruption or to a narco economy, all of which are indeed present. Instead, a closer examination shows that all of these issues are the result of the particular form of capitalist development in the country underpinned by imperialist relations with the US and increasingly over the last few decades with Europe. Further, I show that not only can we link Colombia's violent conflict to a particular form of capitalist development underpinned by imperialism, but also that in stretching our Marxist approach as anti-colonial thinkers like Fanon and Rodney have suggested, we must also account for equally important factors that have played a role 
in the configuration of, oppress of oppression and violence. But factors such as race, and I, would and I would add gender oppression. I argue then that not only must we observe the specific manner in which uh, capitalist imperialism has shaped the social realities of Colombians, but also that racial and gender oppression are a constitutive part of these structures and, by, and that by visibilizing these, by stretching our Marxism, we construct a more accurate picture. And I would argue a more accurate picture gives us the tools with which to, with which to tackle these conditions more, more robustly. Taking into account uh, the above context, my research demonstrates that the European Union, although posing as a civilian force for good, helps to reinforce these conditions in places like El Cerrito and La Paila. In general, the EU and Colombia have strengthened their political and commercial ties since the 1990s. Um, in more recent years, this, is, this more general trend can also be seen in the commerce of sugar. More precisely, after Colombia signed the free trade agreement with the EU around a decade ago, Colombia has become an important supplier of sugar to Western Europe. Providencia, the main sugar company in El Cerrito, sells most of its sugar to European companies with organic sugar quickly becoming the main export since this is the type that Europe now demands. The label of organic, of course, uh, is being stretched here. Moreover, Europeans are not just involved through the purchases of sugar and other primary export products, but in other ways too. For example, a Spanish company controls the local Salvajina Dam, which has had a devastating, devastating ecological impact on that area of the department and is also the main energy supplier to the uh, local sugar companies. Not to mention that individual member states, particularly Spain and the UK, though of course no longer part of the, EU, of the EU, have also supported Colombia's military and police, and therefore, uh, and therefore their known state terrorism and violence. Lastly then, this paper argues that the European Union's peace building objectives in Colombia are in contradiction with its economic interests. If we consider the above case studies, we can observe that the conditions created by the sugar exports industry, bolstered by its recent commerce with Europe, is a case of structural violence in and of itself, but also plays a central role in creating the conditions for more direct violent conflict. For instance, the ex expansion of the sugar plantations needing the forced displacement of communities using armed groups and creating the impoverishment or creating the impoverished social conditions that sometimes leads to people joining armed groups, both insurgencies and paramilitaries. Moreover, even more liberal scholars have called some of the EU's peace building programs the social arm of the military approach. That's to say, it's not just that these programs are in contradiction with their economic interests, they also serve to facilitate the maintenance of the status quo. Like for instance, encouraging less radical forms of social and political organizing with aid programs that condition uh, funding along strict liberal lines. And I think I'll, I'll leave it I'll leave it there and maybe we can pick up uh, some of these ideas and in, in the conversation we'll, we'll now have. Thanks a lot for that, Carlos. And uh, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, read more about especially the current situation in, in Colombia, I strongly recommend Carlos's uh, his journalistic articles and his academic articles are really uh, are excellent and, and based on uh, you know, networks in Colombia. So I definitely encourage you to do that. It's been a pleasure to know Carlos uh, since I first met, first met him and he's been a great help in terms of my own research. So we'll, we'll I'll turn off the recording and uh, open this up to